Thank you for those who are still here. It's wonderful. And all my colleagues, Manos and Manos, I see one Manos. Thank you for inviting me once again. I can't wait to come back. And um, as we get to the end of the road here, uh, I'm going to talk about a specific uh, implant system that we did develop to take care of a very specific problem. And that is patients, and we are seeing it more and more, with massive bone loss. We're not talking about a little wear and tear or a B2 or a B3. We're talking about patients who have really lost the majority of their glenoid vault. These are, oh, I'm getting the wrong thing. So um, my, com and obviously uh, my disclosures on the first slide relate to this implant specifically. So the dilemma we have is what can we do in these, these cases of really what I would call catastrophic bone loss no matter what the cause, and I would reiterate, are happening more and more now. The problem is, you know, a narrowed vault, usually with some wall, loss of, wall, of the wall with excessive er, uh, erosion. Uh, usually we see this in, in some substantial revision cases where there's been bone loss or infection. Uh, we can see it in the oncologic setting, although I don't, we don't see too much of that. But we're seeing it more and more now in those refractory cases of rheumatoid arthritis where they have tremendous wear and glenoid wear, and we're gonna show you a case of that. So what have we had, what have we been able to do up to this point? Well, bone grafting is certainly something we do and have been able to do. Um, uh, autologous is sometimes uh, harder uh, to find because these are revision cases, um, and bone grafting has not been 100% satisfactory. We've used minimal, um, fixation with standard line implants, um, and especially implants, uh, we've even used implants with, as we saw before, with augments, but sometimes the bone loss is just too great. And finally, in some cases, we have resorted uh, to just a painful hemiarthroplasty as a, as a salvage option. Um, so we developed the VRS system, and it actually goes back almost 10 years uh, there, we, the FDA didn't really approve it, and we had to do an un uncompassionate use, and uh, there was no standard of vault reconstructive or patient-specific glenoid available. And using kind of the, the energy and the information and the, and the experience of our hip and knee colleagues in joint replacement with their CAD-CAM concepts, we came up with the concept of replacing uh, uh, basically a boneless vault with, with a metal, uh, with a porous metal that was biointegratable. Uh, the FDA approved this device for reverse shoulders in 2016, and as I'll tell you, we expected to do very few, and what we're finding is we're doing uh, way more than we had expected. I have a slide here that shows a picture of a golden parachute, and I think that really describes this implant. So the objectives in terms of planning are using both 2D, TD and, excuse me, two-dimensional and 3D reconstructions, as you can see from this video, uh, with this very severe amount of bone loss. Um, and our job is to recreate the normal glenohumeral joint line. And I might say that sometimes we want to not necessarily bring it all the way out uh, in the proper version and the proper tilt, as you can see here. Um, to fill the defect as, as much as possible so we get better uh, bio-integration, and then to plan out our optimal position for screws for the best fixation, as you can see here. So there are certain features of this implant that go along with just the concept of filling the space. Uh, the screw mapping during the planning is very good because it gives us an idea of where we're going to be able to put the screws in the best bone, and we can also know if our implant is in the right position because we can measure the screws on our 3D plan and they should match. Uh, the, these implants have a little lip on the front. I think you can see it on the picture to the, I guess I, I don't have the arrow, but on the right-hand side here, and that helps us put the implant in the the right place, and we're going to show you a video of how we do that. Uh, the fast guides we describe here are on the bottom picture. These are after we uh, place the implant, we fix it temporarily with pins through the drill holes using these little fast guides, and in, in they're, they're kind of gold, and that holds the implant, implant provisionally until we can put our central screw in. Uh, instrumentation obviously follows the implant, the implant is made out of titanium and uh, with, uh, with a porous plasma coat spray for better 
um, bio in, 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 you know, in growth. Um, and there is a depth control, as well, I'll show you in a second, for those implants that have a boss so that we don't overream this already uh, very deficient glenoid. So here's a, a video, hopefully it'll show. I, I think we have time to show it. And this is, you know, we really have to expose the glenoid, but there are some, some essential uh, points here. And that is that you have to remove all the soft tissue because the implant is predicated on your CT planning. Uh, so it, it, you need to re re remove this soft tissue so that we can get the implant around the neck of the glenoid. And obviously these have big deformities. We have to be cognizant of the axillary nerve uh, and protect ourselves. You can see I'm doing here. Uh, but the other thing we don't wanna do is remove any bone. This implant is predicated on our planning. And if we take out bone, we can change the trajectory and therefore change uh, whether the implant will fit appropriately. And the other message is you have to do this operation after the planning relatively quickly because the deformity can progress. So here you can see I'm really showing or I'm really getting rid of the soft tissue so I have the real true face of the glenoid um, that I'm, I'm working with and I get a better feeling. Um, now, uh, JP talked a lot about virtual reality. What you're about to see is real reality, and that is that this implant comes with a model, and we use that model intraoperatively to align ourselves, to give ourselves perspective. Uh, so this is, not a, uh, this is not an avatar, this is the real thing. As I said before, and you'll see here, I like to mark out on my dummy the implant where it's gonna sit so I know I'm sitting in the right place, a kind of comparison. There's the lip. And that lip should feel be placed right in the proper position. So we hold that there. And now what we're going to do is we're going to fix this well fixed. We want it not to rock. And we're going to fix it with these temporary pins through these little fast guides. And that's going to give us three-dimensional fixation so that we can place our central screw, which is the real, that's the real workhorse here, that central screw which we're gonna place through this guide. We'll drill it. I don't think I showed the picture of that. And now we're gonna place our screw. It's a 6.5 screw, which should fix to the inner cortex. Once that's been placed and anchored down completely, uh, then we will take the previously placed pins through the guide system and replace them with screws. And to, you, you can almost use this as a relative. The screw should be the same size as what you measured, it's that specific. So here we're replacing the fast guides individually with the appropriate length screws. In this particular case, I did measure the screws uh, to see that they were the same. I, w I tried to speed this up, but they wouldn't, it, I couldn't do it. So we'll just have to bear with me for another minute or so. So here's one of the peripheral screws being placed. Now we've taken out the fast uh, guide, a fast system, and we're gonna place this screw after we measure it as well. And what you're gonna see here is that we've replaced a very, very, very significant defect. And you're gonna see this patient in a few minutes. So uh, keep it in mind. We're gonna show the real planning for this particular patient and everything else. So now we're gonna irrigate. We're gonna make sure that central Morse taper is completely dry because we don't want to have any fluid or blood because that can diminish the fixation through the Morse taper. And we're going to use this little sponge, which is, uh, which is, um, dries that out completely. Um, if we place this, And then finally, we're gonna place the real glenosphere. And we can dial, this is a system which is called Versadile. We can dial it to where we wanna place it, if it be inferiorly, anteriorly, posteriorly, or even superiorly, rarely. Uh, but that's the other option that we use with this particular system. So I think you'll see that's it. These are you know, intra-op photographs of the same thing just to give you a perspective. Uh, and here's what the real implant looks like in play. Uh, this is a, a really the first case I want to show. This is a 64-year-old gentleman, anatomic total shoulder, infected multiple procedures prior, and has tremendous substantial bone loss, as we can see here. This is our 3D plan, uh, and it gives us not only the vault uh, sizing and position, but the screw trajectory. Here's the uh, the uh, you know the plastic uh, 
uh, uh, models that we can use to, to orient ourselves intraoperatively, as I showed you. And as I discussed before, this system has comes in two ways. If there's bone medially enough to have a boss or to have a little better fixation, the, uh, on the, the slide on the left here with that yellow thing, that's a guide so that we don't overream. Um, and that gives us you know, safety in the implant. This is the real, this real implant in place. And this is what this looks like intra, you know, rentonographically. Um, and this is um, uh, basically almost five years later. Uh, and this is a very successful outcome. And it, with no evidence of loosening. This is the patient I just showed you. This is the intraop. This is the patient who we just showed you the intraop uh, 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 film. And this is a 68-year-old female, a rheumatoid with a pseudo paralysis, severe deformity, marked acromial disease that we can talk about. Um, but we opted to avoid that. Um, here's I think this should show us how how really just how severe the deformity is, as you can see here. Uh, and we opted to do a VRS in this woman. Uh, this is a 3D. And again, she has medialized. She's uh, lost the whole posterior wall. And now this is 36 months later. And you can see here, with the, uh, she's got very reasonable forward elevation, reasonable abduction. Um, and if you want to see, this is very good external rotation. And she'll turn around here in a second and you'll see that she has really remarkable internal rotation. And I just saw that Bassam showed a patient like this with remarkable internal rotation. And I think it may be related in addition to the implant to her scapula, her thorax, uh, maybe giving her more room. So let me talk a little bit about our results. The first results we reported was a combined study with Simon Frostick, who no longer, unfortunately, has tragically passed on. And this was his group and our group in 2019 at the international, uh, um, an international a group of, uh, of um, co International Congress of Shoulder and Elbow Surgery in Buenos Aires. We presented 26 patients, basically males and females equal, average age 64, for these variety of reasons, most of which were revision for glenoid loosening that had went on to failure, infection, RA, as I saw there, and uh, failed bone grafts. The results in all the uh, patient outcome scores were statistically significant in improvement. Range of motion was significantly improved, but these are not home runs. These are not people reaching 180 degrees in all cases, but these are people that usually are so severely disabled that 90 or 100 degrees is, is a win for them. Now, in this group, we had 23 out of 26 who were extremely satisfied. One was revised for loss of fixation, a second, there were two that had recurrent infections, unfortunately. Um, and at mid-range follow-up, they all there had been no change in position in their x-rays. Now, um, uh, Anna Murthy looked at our group, they looked at this implant in his group um, at Jeff, and they found that they had seven primary, seven primary cases and five revisions. Again, very similarly, they had statistical improvement in all patient a reported outcome measures, including the ASCS and SANE, uh, and their PEN scores, and in all aspects of range of motion. Um, and they felt that this study demonstrated that this was a very effective uh, and meaningful tool in these most severe deformities. Uh, but uh, like, as we will say, and I will agree, we have to watch these carefully over the next few years. Very similarly, um, John Edamora from California had uh, his first 19 patients, he's done a lot more, I don't know why, but I, I think he has a, the biggest series so far. Their follow-up was relatively short in this particular paper, but again, similar results. Excellent improvement, statistically significant in all patient uh, reported outcomes and in range of motion. They had one infection, they had one humeral shaft fracture, which really had nothing to do with the glenoid, um, and one instability with a hematoma. Uh, and again, their conclusions similarly, very satisfactory outcomes in very, very devastating cases. But again, we should keep our eyes open and follow these patients carefully. Now we're gonna, we, this is a, uh, our, our data that we're, will be, was just reported at, uh, the, uh, at the AOS, and it, it was our IRB approved study of 26 patients 
13 and 13, uh, females, males. Average age, you can see here, with a follow-up that ranged from basically two and a half years, well, one year, but an average two and a half years, but up to five years. Uh, there were 11 primaries, 15 revisions. Uh, we did have a higher complication rate it would by number, I think, but I also think this is because we were the first to use this implant, and I think in the beginning, uh, some of the technical improvements have helped in terms of positioning, fixation, and the like. But we did have three dislocations, two of which were, were, were fixed. Uh, one patient refused. We had one deep infection, um, and we had one patient who actually fell and broke off the implant. So my observations about this implant are it should be used in catastrophic cases. I am not advocating, I know Eddie McFarland talked before and was nice enough to mention me and said that in the future I believe that perhaps all implants will be patient specific. I, I didn't mean this group, I meant maybe at some point with um, 3D mapping and so forth, every patient will have their own implant. But in this particular case, in these catastrophic uh, situations, I think that this implant offers us a really good solution. Um, problems are, it's, a, it's technically difficult, it is expensive, so in certain areas it may not be as readily available, but certainly catastrophic uh, glenoid bone loss or deformity, it's a really difficult challenge. Restoration of the glenoid joint line in the coronal plane we know is critical for success. This patient-specific implant in severe deficiency may offer a better and more durable solution than bone grafting and other techniques. And the future is now. We expected that we would do, they, the, that there would be 60 or 70 of these a year, and there's a lot more being done throughout the country and throughout other parts of the world. So thank you for your attention. Thank you for staying here. Thank you to Manos and Manos for a wonderful meeting, and I can't wait to come back. And stay safe, and thank you. And I will say one thing. It's late, so I don't want any hard questions. <laughs> well, on that vein, uh, I wanted to begin by opening the floor to any questions for Dr. Dines. Uh, David, it's really, really promising. And these are the end of the road cases. I mean, these are disastrous. Practically, you do a CT scan, you get a patient specific implant, you decide where you want it, and the, the engineers are developing it? No, or? this is, they do this in conjunction with you. This is not a 3D plan the night before with, uh, with Blueprint or something like this. This is actually, you send them a specific C, 2D and 3D reconstruction, and there, there are parameters that they need. And so you send the patient, and when they do the CT scan, it's specific to that, and then this is a cooperative venture. You, you do this with the engineer, so that, like I said, you know, you can recreate a medial, the joint line where you want it. In some cases, we don't want to completely lateralize if they have a lot of soft tissue deficiency and stuff. We may want to have the ability to build that up with, with the uh, glenosphere. So, so you really have the ability to work with them to plan it. And it's, uh, it's, a, it's a combination, uh, co you know, combined effort. Thank you. I think we got one. Oh, Bissa. Here, I gave you a compliment and you're gonna. <laughs> well, thanks for the compliment. It's about the internal rotation. Uh, so uh, for the proximal humerus, massive, massive like bone loss, there is also like either metallic reconstruction. This is almost like the metallic reconstruction of the proximal humerus bone loss. Like now we have this metallic reconstruction of the glenoid. The, pro the difference though, with the humerus, if this, the metallic reconstruction did not work, you can reconstruct it with bone. My question for you, I think this is great, and I know these are very bad cases, but what would be your backup right now? Now you have a screw in every corner of this humerus, of the glenoid, there's one in the, up in the spine of the scapula, so mm -hmm. if this failed, what's your backup? Well, I think at this point, this is a heroic, and I think at that point, if it fails, they end up with a hemiarthroplasty, as I said, a salvage hemiarthroplasty, because that, that's the last station. That's the last train station here. I don't, I don't have another solution at that point. I really don't. What, what, is, what is the best outcome you've seen with this? The best is yeah. that little lady you just saw. The one that you I saw. Mean, that's, you that's, a, that's where she lied. I, I would say that we see that in about 30 or 40%. We see 
minimal as the numbers you, you could you could see. M basically, 100 degrees, 95, 100 degrees in the majority. It, it's a it's almost like the old Charlie Near. Um, he had a he had a score system for the most severe patients, and it was uh, it was not what you'd expect to be 180 degrees. No, I, limited I mean, goals. I, I mean. really think this is a very good, like good salvage procedure. The only thing because. Uh, I had to help the tumor surgeon revising one because it dislocated. Okay. And after dislocated, now they're stuck because like they're trying to uh, do a different kind of like tricks to get it. Uh, they did it twice mm. and they could not get it stable. So did you encounter any such situation where uh, the implant became dislocated and became hard to do? We've, to we've had the one that I've done twice was a, a, a fellow who we did after infected after a hemiarthroplasty for fracture. Um, and he had a really, really an, a good result. And he was young. He was 66 and, and an active guy. Fell and he broke the glenoid. So we took it out, left it out, took away all the hardware, let things quiet down, re re, you know, re you know, basically re-imaged him and brought him back later with a new implant. And that's two years ago and he's still doing fine. Now, th these are anecdotal because we just don't have a big enough series yet. But if you notice, these are all now coming out. We've only been able to use this implant uh, with, without being compassionate or compassionate usage for the last three and a half, four years. So five years. So you're, we're going to see more, long, more longer term results. And I think, you know, the jury is out. But I think in general, it's very potentially good it's where we are. Thank you. Okay. In the interest of time, we're going to end this session. Thank you, Dr. Dines, for a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you.